In this episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast, my guy Leif Tulane is going to share his thoughts on three wings that he believes deserve a first round grade. So find out the three wings that are upperclassmen that Leif is higher on than the consensus. Stay tuned. Big, big shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. I'm your host, Rafael Barlow, and like I mentioned, I have my co-host for today, Leaf Tulane. And once again, thank you for, again, making this your first listen of the day, your first listen of the year. And thank you for supporting the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast all of 2023. If you are a new listener we are your source for daily NBA draft content. We do a podcast five days a week. And so if you love the NBA draft, then you love the NBA Big Board podcast. All right. Before I get started, I want to let you know that this episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. It is the easiest and the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. So go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA. Use the code in all lowercase letters, locked on NBA. And you can get a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars. All right, Leaf. Happy New Year! Way to uh, start off this year with with a good episode, in my opinion. I think this is going to be really good. And one of the reasons I think it's going to be good is because James and I we did a a mock draft, picks one through thirty, and the the first that that we did it in like the lottery, and then we did the second half. And anybody that's done this draft stuff knows that there's, I mean, there's at least 75 guys that I think could possibly get drafted this year, maybe even more. And when you leave off different guys, you know, um, it gets kind of controversial. But, I mean, I think anybody that does a mock draft is going to draw some criticism. And so you have three guys that you believe are first-rounders, and none of these three players made our first-round mock. So... I want to hear your thoughts on these players and why you believe they're their first rounders. So before we get into that, how was your your New Year's? Uh, it was uneventful in terms of December 31st, but January 1st was great. I played the best basketball I have of the year, obviously the first day of the year, but probably the past 365 days. And so I started off the new year very well. Man, I haven't played in a while. I was I was playing like two or three times a week, and then I just haven't. Man, I, I probably haven't played in like three months. I need to I need to get back at it. So mine was uneventful. Yesterday I was sick as a dog. I mean, it's it's like I'm good for a few days, but then I mean yesterday was the worst I've I felt in a while. But at least I had my voice, which has been going in and out. But anyway, let let's get into your wings. Like who is a wing that you are higher on than the consensus and you have a first round grade for uh one that i think stands out is jalen tyson from cal formerly of both texas and texas tech and i think part of the reason he's flying under the radar is not production based it's just because of where he's playing the team is bad so people may attribute it to empty calorie scoring but you watched him play i i had my eye on him at texas tech and he transferred due to uh, the coach having some some issues. Let's just leave it at that. They're they're larger than just small issues. But uh, he left, and he found a landing spot under Mark Madsen at Cal. And I, I've watched them a few times, and they're not a pretty watch. But the way he plays, the aggression, and playing to his athletic strengths with with some on ball capacity has me intrigued. And I don't think there's that many players that have the same mix of athleticism and on ball. Uh, capacities that in this draft as there typically are. And so I don't think you can really sell me there's 30 players with the the same potential as he has, even if he isn't technically an upperclassman. Jalen's from the Dallas area. It's actually um, Plano where, where I've lived most of my time. So I'm very familiar with this game. I've done some video work for him. Really good, good kid. I'm definitely rooting for him. What's interesting about his story is that if you watch him play at Texas Tech and you watch him play at Cal, he's playing two totally different roles. So it's like it, at, at Texas Tech, he was a, I believe, like a 40% shooter from three. This year, the three-point shooting numbers are down, but the playmaking is way up. He has more 
on ball responsibilities, which I think helps his draft stock. And I've always felt like he's one of the best wing rebounders in, in college basketball. And so if he's putting it all together this year, averaging a little under 20 points a game, but seven rebounds, 3.4 assists. And like I said, the shooting is down from three at 31%, but he's still efficient at 47% from the floor. What would you say his greatest strength is and his the, the skill set that he would be able to hang his hat on in the NBA? I think he's versatile enough to play both as a role player, as a shooter. I, I think a lot of his bad shooting performances have come from the team being down and he's there kind of like, hey, catch the grenade, go score type of guy. I think he is a better shooter than that. Uh, I, I mean, right now he's shooting 32% from three, but 47% from the field. And so he's slicing and dicing to the rack pretty well. And there have been a few games that have just been really bad from three and a lot that have been steady. Um, so I think the really bad shows up like two of 10 against SDSU, um, San Diego State, that is at Texas Tech last year. You're right. He shot 40 percent from three and he was 73 percent from the line, shooting 48 percent from the field. And I think he's a good defender. He's got a length and athleticism that intrigues me. Uh, I, I also think the best skill set that he may have that's underrated is rebounding. He really rebounds the ball. He's averaging seven and a half boards per game, along with 20 points right now. And defensively, he's taking probably the best offensive player each time. Offensively, he's scoring at a high clip, being asked to do a lot. Now, if you minimize his role and ask him to be a 3 and D guy who spaces the floor and defends, I think he can really do that pretty easily. What do you think about his shot creation? I feel like there are flashes where he shows that he can create his own shot, shows some some shiftiness and just craftiness with the handle. What do you think about him as a as a shot creator and shot maker? I think it I think it's flashes like you said. I don't think it's well-rounded, but I do think that there's enough versatility in the way he creates his shots for him to be someone I I, uh, I believe in because he's able to go to the rim and use length around the rim. I wouldn't say it's like unbelievable explosiveness, but he uses length and he kind of slithers to the rack and he uses um step Strength. backs and, and shot creation based on using just like powerful stepping back to his right or his left. And his mid range game is, isn't something that I think we'll see in the NBA a lot of, but it shows that he can do it. So I, I actually am higher on the offensive potential. And I think people are forgetting right now how much he was viewed as an athlete and a defender earlier in his collegiate career. So one of his trainers is a good friend of mine named Brian Adams. So shout out to Brian Adams. And Brian is like an old school trainer. He loves the mid-range and footwork. And he has this saying, if Jordan didn't do it, then I won't teach it. And so I know when uh, him and Jalen work out together, it is a bunch of mid-range and, and footwork and, and, and mid-post stuff. So it, it's pretty cool to see him implement that in a game. I would say like the rebounding to me, I mean, I know you mentioned it's underrated. I mean, he's just been a good rebounder, but I, I would say like the biggest surprise for me is just the the passing this year, like the court vision. He's shown some live dribble passing. I think he's just done a, a good job of, of showing what, what he's capable of outside of Texas Tech's system. Do you think that Cal's, lack of wins is, is going to impact him down the line? I don't think it should. I think there are players that get hurt by having bad teams, meaning they shoot worse percentages. And then I think there are players that elevate their stock by scoring empty points on bad teams. And I think the fact that he has played at a high major before and shown he can play a role. And honestly, Texas Tech was pretty bad last year. And then when Jalen Tyson played, they improved drastically. Uh, for those of you who love college basketball, like I do, like that's that's the case. Like they had an offensive weapon and the athleticism to use defensively to play some of their more uh, aggressive defensive tactics. Uh, I, I think because he showed role player capacity that that now has the star player um, and he's functioning, he's not excelling to a level that I think is getting national notoriety, but he's functioning and doing it well enough that people like you and I take notice of him is, is a good sign. So I would say there is a good chance that his stock elevates, especially when he does athletic testing. I think he's going to excel in the athletic testings. I want to talk to you about prize picks. Prize picks is daily fantasy made easy, and it is the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America. 
the easiest and the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. It is just you against the numbers. So instead of battling thousands of other players, including pros and sharks, it's just you versus the projected numbers. You pick more or less than two to six players in their stat projections, and you can watch the winnings roll in. And with basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball in a specials league. It is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. For example, you can have LeBron James plus Travis Kelsey at a 10.5 combo of three pointers made and receptions. But more importantly, well, I, I would say more importantly, Price Picks has a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. So for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, the player gets rebooted. And Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. So all you have to do is go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA. Use the code locked on NBA has to be in lowercase. And you can get a first deposit match up to $100. So prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA. Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. Check out Locked On Sports today. It is here for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it is covering the top sports stories of the day with the Locked On local experts plus the Locked On national shows that cover every league. So go to Locked On Sports today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. All right, we left off talking about Jalen Tyson. Who is the next wing that you are higher on than the consensus and you believe deserves a first-round grade? Baylor Shireman. And I spoke with a few people the last couple of days that are in the scouting community, um, one, of, uh, one of whom for a team and the other that uh, was writing a piece for Yahoo Sports. And I said, why isn't Shireman a first rounder? He shoots the ball really well. He's ready to play defensively. He looks like just just about as good a defender as Trey Alexander when you watch Creighton play. Obviously, Kalkbrenner is their anchor, and maybe that's like maybe that makes everyone look better. He's shooting the ball. He's rebounding. He's their go to scorer, and he's a very good passer. And earlier in his career, for those of you who watched a lot of college basketball, he was a point guard at South Dakota State. And he was the player of the year in that conference. And he was supposed to be a guy that you expected to be on the ball. He's transitioned to an off ball guy who's a dead eye shooter, an eight a game rebounder, and someone that is not afraid to distribute the ball and defend the uh, top wings in the Big East. Granted, the Big, Big East it doesn't have any unbelievable wings right now, but I it's just hard to ignore production. And when I watch him play, I see this like, seamless transition into being a shooter and a rotation player. And I think the Nuggets formula of taking guys that have played a lot of college basketball and excelled there um, has made me more inclined to believe in players transitioning, even when they're older, when they have defined skill sets. Yeah. I mean, I, I like Baylor a lot. I mean, obviously I'm from Omaha, so I, I like Creighton guys. Or I follow Creighton guys. I would say the knock on him is that, He's he was like what three years or or two years at like above forty percent from three, and then at Creighton last year it was like thirty six. He's at thirty six percent this year, which is good. I mean it's on a high volume of attempts. I think that people may have boxed him in as a shooter, and when when you're kind of boxed in or labeled as a shooter, they're expecting thirty eight, thirty nine, or or forty plus from three, but he's I mean, he's a guy that you got to respect as a shooter. Very, very good rebounder. So I'm I'm seeing a trend here. You're liking these wings that that rebound the ball. And he's a very good rebounder. And he's a good passer. He has the size. I just think for him, it's all going to depend on how well he shoots the ball. Which, like I said, he's shooting the ball well. But I think that the role that he's going to have in the NBA would be as a shooter. And so... If he can get that percentage up to around 38, 39, or 40, then I I, I think that he, he could get drafted. But I just feel like with this draft, man, it's so weird. I, I think that 
there's not a big gap between maybe guys projected to go anywhere between 15 and 35. And then I can even say 20 through 60. It's, it's, it's not a, a big gap. I definitely think there's going to be multiple guys that are not drafted that are going to find their way on NBA rosters next year. Let me let me pose a question for you here. Right. Baylor Shireman. So uh, while I agree with you that his percentage uh, isn't as high as you expect for a shooter, like last year we saw Jordan Hawkins shoot 40%. We saw Grady Dick shoot just over 40%. Jet Howard, same idea. None of those guys were like the bailout guy. And so I'm I'm looking it up. This is a theory I haven't figured out yet fully fledged, but I'm on Synergy. I'm going to see what his catch and shoot is because I've watched Shireman in person twice and he his stroke is beautiful. He really shoots it well. He's an excellent per synergy in terms of percentile pick and roll ball handler. And then when you find spot up, he is average of the shot types. He is on unguarded catch and shoots. He's very good and he's shooting 48% from three on unguarded catch and shoots. So to me, three I think on he's... Jumpers. Uh, catch and shoot. It, oh, it, so that it's under. It doesn't say three. So yeah, it must be yeah, jumpers. But I, but I'd imagine, I'd imagine, just about all of those are threes. I've watched a ton of Creighton games. I haven't seen him shoot many unguarded mid range jump shots on catch and shoot. Th- that said, here's my real reason. Would you rather have a a guy like Terrence Shannon? Obviously, this is before some legal issues, or Kevin McCuller. Um shoot who have better three point percentages or by Baylor Shireman. I think Shireman's twelve times the shooter they are. Yeah, I, I think so. I just think sometimes Shireman is getting penalized in a sense because before he transferred to Creighton, he shot like forty seven percent from three. He was billed at that year as like the best shooter in the country. I know people that said that he's the best shooter in the country. I mean forty seven percent from three on a good volume of attempts. And so, like I like I said, I'm from Omaha, and I know people that are from the area and or, or you know, follow Creighton. And so people are, have been pleased with his play, but also a little bit disappointed in, in the shooting because, I mean, while he is one of the better shooters, I just think that the, the premature label of him being, like, the best shooter in the country, it, the, the numbers don't support that this year. But, no, I would – if I had to, you know, like – choose who's gonna shoot the game winning shot or who do I believe is a better shooter I would definitely take Shireman over over Kevin McCuller I think Shireman's a guy that when he's off like he has some off shooting nights and when he's off like it really impacts the percentages I mean I can say the same thing about about um uh his teammate Trey Alexander Trey's had some some games that really like killed his percentage i mean i'm looking at that baylor's numbers he was 0 for 7 from three against villanova he had a game where he took 19 threes did you see that game yeah it's when they're down they go to him and force like when creighton has lost they kind of what what they lost in kaluma and uh nemhard is physical ability to get into the paint which creates good shots yep. so when they're down and forcing it's like you're asking Alexander and Shireman to create, and it often is tough, difficult, contested shots. But when he's open, my goodness, is he an unbelievable shooter. Like the last game I watched all of, and he was 7 of 13, and every three he took was was just picture perfect when it was open. Oh, yeah, the shot looks good. It it, it looks money. But, yeah, I mean, I, I think that there are some teams that are really going to like him. I mean, I think of – I mean, it's just a, a a lazy fit, but you look at a team like Detroit, you you need a guy like Baylor Shireman. So if you got like a second round pick, and if you know maybe they end up with another first, but he he's a guy that would complement their roster their roster very well. Do you think he should play more point forward at Creighton this year? I. Uh, I don't know because I think Alexander's being dealt a difficult hand because Ashworth isn't a point guard and they're asking him to be. So Alexander's trying to score and be a facilitator and it's just kind of caught in between. I like that Shireman's playing the role that I presume he'll play at the NBA level. Um, and, and so I actually think it's good for his stock to, to show what he does off the ball. But he, that said, he's still averaging over four assists per game and his pick and roll Numbers are through the roof. Uh, he obviously has a great role target in Kalkbrenner. 
I think it shows versatility, and I think it's a way that the NBA space it, Creighton plays with NBA spacing more than just about any college team. And I think it's beneficial to uh, Shireman stock. And I, I could see him being one of those guys that shoots well at the combine and goes up draft boards, even though he's older, uh, maybe kind of of the ilk of Hunter Tyson. Yep. What do you think about his athleticism? I think he's a sneaky underrated athlete and I don't say sneaky because he's white. I know that's a term that's often used with white players, but I think he's a better athlete than he gets credit for. He, I agree completely. And, and I mentioned rebounding at the outset. Like I, I typically do like wings that rebound, but that's not the most important thing ever. Um, but what he does, he, he's got a nose for the ball. He jumps and rebounds. I, I think he's a better defender than given credit for by both college experts and draft guys, just because he takes on every wing. It's not, it's never Mason Miller, Isaac Trout. It's, it's, uh, he plays, he basically guards two through four and takes the best wing on the other team. And now is a, and is a dead eye shooter and the bailout guy on your team. So I think his percentages would be better if he wasn't defending some of the tougher guys. And I think he'd, his percentages would be better if he wasn't the bailout guy. Um, so I, I, I really think he projects more as like a 40% shooter. Um, and this is one where I'm just trusting my eyes as a shooter, where as opposed to numbers, because I've watched Creighton play a ton of times. I've seen him in person twice. And I, I really like what he does on the floor outside of shooting, but I buy his shooting as his main stock. Like everyone says, oh, what trait's going to keep you on the floor at the NBA level? Well, for me, it's it's shooting for him, but I also think he's a better defender than advertised. I think he's a better rebounder than advertised. And, and why can't he be George Niang at the next level? Niang's carved out a nice career. He was much maligned at times in Utah, but I think I think he's a good player. And I think Shireman's probably a better athlete than Niang is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, George is. George spends a significant part of his offseason here in Dallas. I've seen him work out a few times. I actually was in the gym with him uh, a couple summers ago. And George is one of the more amazing stories because he doesn't pass the eye test, doesn't jump. He's just very smart and just knows his role. So here, here's the, the debate that I've had with, with people that I, I speak to from home from Creighton. And so one one of the knocks is they're they're disappointed in the shooting, which again, I mean, he shot forty seven percent the year before, so they were expecting a higher percentage. And one of the arguments that I've had is that the shooting percentage went down ten points as the competition went up. What do you think the reason behind that is? I think part of it is athleticism shot quality is not quite as good when players are bigger and coming out of you. I also think last year, a large part of it was fitting into a team that had a lot of players that wanted the ball. Uh, Kaluma, Alexander, Nemhard, Kalkbrenner, and then Shireman was kind of like considered the fifth fiddle at first. And then he developed. I think this year, the reason it's about the same as last year is he's taking an expanded role. I also think, some players play better being the main guy. And he, I think he is one of those guys when, when Creighton's been shorthanded uh, he's played excellently and he was often on the ball and working around screens and against inferior athletes um, in, in mid-major basketball. I think if he came off screens and shot behind screens that that can help him get in the rhythm and being the top guy allows you to really feel like feel your game at the highest level. I think fitting in sometimes is difficult, but I have no doubt about his shot. Like he, he, I think he might be one of the best three shooters in this draft class. So I, I'm not too concerned about a 36 and a half percent three point shooting percentage. All right. That's fair. All right. In the last segment, we're going to find out who is the next wing that Leaf believes deserves a first round grade. But let's talk about FanDuel because the NFL season is wrapping up and there's still time to get in on the action with FanDuel. It is America's number one sports book. And right now, all new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $150 in bonus bets, win or lose. The app is easy to use, and there are so many different ways to bet. For example, they have live, same game parlays, find bets in the new Explore tab. You can make a parlay in the Parlay Hub, which is the best way to find popular parlays and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet a layup. FanDuel, the official partner of the NFL. 
All right, last segment. Who is the next player that you believe is 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 not talked about enough by the consensus, and you would give him a first round grade? I'm going with Wuga Poplar of Miami. Wuga Poplar is a very good athlete who is shooting the lights out uh, from three, and he's considered to be a better mid range scorer. Um, than he is a three-point shooter, but he's shooting 50% from three, 50. And, and the volume's not as high as Shireman's, but it's definitely not low. He's shooting five threes a game, and he's shooting 87.5% from the free throw line, scoring 16 points a, a game for Miami and rebounding pretty well as well, five rebounds. He's not what I would consider like an elite rebounder, but he's the best athlete in terms of like explosivity of the guys we've talked about here. And he's shooting the best percentage. And he's gotten a role because uh, Isaiah Wong and um, Miller, Jordan Miller, moved on from Miami. He takes an expanded role. He and Matthew Cleveland are the wings. And he's he's shined, and he looks the part moving on the basketball floor. Miami's got a little gimmicky system, but I buy him far more than I ever believed in Isaiah Wong. And I was notably low on Isaiah Wong. Richard Uh-oh. and I discussed this many times. <laughs> Don't let Richard. Um, I, I never was an Isaiah Wong guy. I thought Miller was the best player on the team last year. But I'm far higher on Poplar as an NBA prospect than I was on either of those guys I mentioned. Yeah, I, I like him a lot. I know the people from Philly will – Come in and correct me if we don't say his name right, but it is Wooga. Wooga. <laughs> it's part of the 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 Philly accent. But no, nah, if you look at his numbers, like the efficiency is crazy. 52% from the floor, 50% from three. And it's on a high volume of attempts, shooting 87% from the foul line. I think that he has the tools to be a three-level scorer. I think he has the athleticism. I think he has the, the tools. But it's like he's a two-level score in a sense, but it's mid-range and threes. He he doesn't get to the rim enough for me, but I think he's capable of doing it. It's like he has a handle, but he has a handle that is built for creating space so he can get to his pull-up as opposed to using his handle to get downhill. But I like him a lot. He just missed – actually, I know me and my brother, we did our, our mock, but on – my personal, my personal mock draft, I have him as a first round pick. I have him, I have him actually going twenty six to the Sixers. I haven't released this yet. I mean, I probably, I mean, the it's been a couple games, so the the draft order has has changed. But I do have him as a first round pick. But I am a big fan of his game, and I do think that he can, he could improve his draft stock or at least maximize his, his talent if you were able to pl- apply a little bit more pressure at the rim? Well, I think part of the reason he's not attacking the rim that much is Miami plays this like strange perimeter-oriented uh, offense where they pass the ball to one player to create an advantage and then to create a three for another. Like They bring in a freshman named Kaishan George who's long and he he doesn't go to the rim very much either. He shoots a lot of threes and it's like, okay, why are you why are you dancing with the ball to shoot a three? Obviously Nigel Pack is a three-point shooter. Matthew Cleveland's a better slasher than a three-point shooter, but he's shooting a lot of threes. So Poplar to me, if he's in an NBA team that like is kind of is going with that swing swing offense and attack closeouts, I could see him uh, slashing pretty well and getting to the rim because he's not shooting that few of free throws. Like I would like him to shoot more and I agree with you. But but it's like he still is finding his way to uh, three free throws a game. I'd like him to shoot five, and, and I think that's a sign of a good score. But it also, I think he's young in his in terms of his maturation as a basketball player. Not in terms of like he's a junior, but he's played behind guys that were on the ball, so he was playing as a three-point shooter. And now I think the next step is to become a three-level scorer, meaning getting to the rim. But I do think Miami's a little gimmicky in terms of their offense, which – doesn't allow him to go to the rim as often as as I think. But against Kentucky, the best athletes, he went to the rim. He just didn't shoot well. But overall for the season, he's shooting 77% at the rim. It's like when he gets there, he's he's finishing. He just only has 31 attempts at the rim, which is, I mean, 31 attempts in, in 12 games isn't too bad. But if you, you figure like you take away the, the attempts in transition, and the numbers is significantly smaller when you when you break it down to in the half court. So that's why I feel like he can be a three level scorer because once he gets there, he can't finish. 
And I think that he has, like I said, he has the creativity to create space. But I just believe that if, if he puts it all together, he could be one of the few guys in this draft that I think can score on three levels in, in the NBA. Yeah, I think I think one more thing. I'm I'm looking at synergy right now about Poplar. It's it's he drives right more frequently than left, but not by an, an alarming number for someone who's not kind of new to uh, being that guy who's the who's an attacker. So I, I think part of it's finding comfort with being the number one on a team. And I think Miami, even like Isaiah Wong got to the rim a lot, but it was because they had guys feeding him and setting up Miller was played on the interior and spun. This team's finding it's, it's footing. And it's funny looking at this. I don't think he's a great passer necessarily, but he's an excellent category in terms of pick and roll ball handling, which means his decision-making is pretty decent. Typically you measure athleticism based on what they do in transition and at the rim. And like you mentioned, he's 77% at the rim and his transition uh, is considered excellent, which you would see based on the eye test. He's a good athlete. So if a good athlete is shooting 50% from three, 88% 88% from the free throw line. And we think he's going to be able to attack the rim. I, I don't see why more people aren't seeing him like us as a first round pick. Yeah. I think the biggest area for him to, to show improvement on in the second half of the season, or as we enter conference play, is just be being a better like decision maker and a passer right now. He has more turnovers than assist. And so I would love to see him just to show some improvement as, as a playmaker. And then, like I said, just get to the rim. But I disagree in a sense because I just think about Isaiah Wong. I just think his mentality was to get to the rim. I think he had more so of a a more – I mean, we know that he was a very an aggressive scorer, but I just think it was the, the mentality is the difference between them and, and as far as getting to the rim. Do you have a team that you think would be a good fit for him? I know you, you kind of mentioned Denver – and, and Baylor Shireman, but do you think there's a team that that would be a good fit? Uh, I, I haven't thought about it very much. Uh, when you said Philly, I, I like that. Um, I, I think there's I, I, one that comes to my mind is maybe Phoenix, a, a guy who can attack closeouts and hit open threes. Um, yeah. The way they're constructed, at least that said, their timeline is not super wide with Durant uh, as someone who's aging, obviously he's still excellent, but basically most teams need a guy who can shoot and attack closeouts. And with that type of athleticism, I think you can learn defense. Yep. Um, and I don't think he's bad on defense either. I, I just want to say that right there. I just don't think he's as good as he could be. Um, so I think there's a lot of teams that could use that type of player. Uh, Milwaukee's one, but he just doesn't fit their timeline. Um, one that would intrigue me would be Indiana, who's a totally different timeline because he would play fast. He's a really good athlete. Halliburton can run, get tons of people open shots. And they may not want to pay for a guy like Buddy Heald to come back. And and maybe he get alongside Ben Mather and can fill some wings for yeah. Terry's Halliburton's offense. I can see that. My my favorite choice is Philly. He's the Philly guy. You're always going to need shooting when you have Joel and B. And uh, he, he can attack a closeout. And so I, I would love to see him play at home in Philly. Well, that wraps up this episode. We covered three wings that Leaf believes deserve a first-round grade and are not getting enough love from the consensus. Let us know your thoughts. Let us know if you believe Jalen Tyson, Baylor Shireman, and Wooga Popular should be first-round picks. And let us know if you believe that there's someone else that we should have mentioned, which I'm sure, you know, we only mentioned three players. And so... There's a, there's, there's a long list of guys. So if you're on YouTube, leave a comment. Let us know um, who, who you feel deserves a first round grade. That, that is a wing. That is a wing. Once again, it's Rafael Barlow with Leaf Tulane, and we are out.